later. I lay awake and mulled over the events of the day and the utter lack of control I had over my life. Prior to being moved into the room with Paul, the certainties of my life were finite and unappealing. I was turned in my bed every three hours. And in the mornings, a corpsman shaved, bathed, and fed me. My dressings were then changed, and for the rest of the day, various doctors and nurses poked and prodded at me as if I were a side of beef in a meat market. I no longer had any idea of my own capabilities, and whatever dignity I once possessed had abandoned me as surely as my lip missing limbs. For weeks, I had been brooding over the idea of asking Toddy for a divorce since I did not feel it was fair to force her into a lifetime of caring for a helpless cripple. I had, in fact, considered suicide, but I now laughed, despite my melancholy when I realized that I was incapable of throwing myself out of the partially open window only a few feet from my bed. As I watched Paul sleeping peacefully in the bed across the room from me, I wished desperately for one night's rest, free of pain or discomfort. It then occurred to me that Paul must have been through the same hell I was now experiencing. And he had survived the ordeal. He had also redefined his relationship with his wife in a positive manner in a few and in a few weeks would be putting the Marine Corps and the Vietnam War behind him and looking for a job. By the time blessed sleep finally came, I had begrudgingly come to realize that I must undergo a drastic change in attitude to avoid spending the rest of my life as a miserable, lonely freak. As Paul's roommate, I was privy to many of the conversations he had with the other patients of ESCO Q12 many of whom stopped by that first week to wish him luck on his operation. They were a diverse assortment of young Marine and Naval officers who entered our room in wheelchairs, on crutches, or using unfamiliar prosthetics that for many were to become lifelong companions. Varied in their backgrounds and personalities, they bore the scars of a war that, whatever its de devastation, produced a bonding among them far more powerful in some ways than the ties of family kinship. Some, like Lieutenant Joe Belzer, who had been wounded three times, treated their disabilities as affirmations of manhood and where it wore their wooden legs and eye patches as badges of honor. While others were truly shattered by the wounds they had suffered, Lieutenant Cleve McClary, who had lost an arm and an eye to a Viet Cong satchel charge, turned to Christ to restore wholeness to his life. And Lieutenant Cal Goodman, who is now missing his legs, his testicles, and his right thumb, cursed God and anyone who was foolish enough to cross his path. <laughs>